everyone. Welcome to the Let's Talk It Out podcast. I'm your host, Alec Lifshultz, a.k.a. Trey Busy. It is January 9th, 2020, man. I haven't talked to you guys since last year. Um, it's been a while. I, it feels like it's been a while since I did an episode. Usually you guys are used to me doing it every week, but I just had to take some time off. Um, I've been fasting for, for uh, 16 hours a day for the last two weeks, and I plan on going into my birthday to January 20th. And so far, I mean, the, the, not even just the physical aspect of it, but mentally and spiritually, I've just been seeing an increase in myself. You know, my focus and my drive are on another level right now. And I really do, you know, it is hard, but I really do appreciate the results. Um, my last guest I had come on was my sister. You know, she wanted to come on. I had her share her story about how she started off as just a sales associate at Verizon. Now she's the district manager for the South region of Chicago. So it's incredible to see the sacrifice she had to make in order to make a better life for her daughter. And I really do appreciate her for taking time out to share her story openly with me. But I'm not alone today. Um, I have a very special guest with me today. Um, he took time out of his busy life to have a conversation with me. I mean, this guy, you know, most of you guys know he played in NHL, but and also coach as well. But the way he's doing that's really, you know, drawn me towards him as being open about his story, his own mental health condition, and also helping people out there that are dealing with them. So I want to welcome to the show, Clint Malachuk. Great to be on. Thanks for having me. Man, thank you for, for again, like I said, you, you could have been doing anything else. So I want you to tell people a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, you, you know, we're talking mental health. Uh, some people want to call it mental illness. Uh, but I just like uh, I, I, I like to say our mental well-being, because sometimes uh, uh, people uh, tend to get scared when they hear mental illness. And uh, and not everybody is 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 mentally ill like me. But uh, I think most people can relate to mental uh, wellness. And sometimes people will go through periods of their life uh, where they're, they're, they're not mentally ill, but they're struggling mentally with, uh, with certain issues. It might be a minor form or a major form of anxiety, depression. Uh, I have obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, you know, playing in the NHL. As a kid, uh, I, I kind of had a, an abusive father, so I had some issues with anxiety uh, growing up. And it uh, developed into undiagnosed obsessive compulsive disorder back Back in that day, you know, it's, uh, I'm almost I'm 58 years old, so uh, there wasn't a lot out there for, for help for people or even diagnoses. And, uh, you know, for me, make, I use my obsessive compulsive disorder to uh, do things repetitiously. And uh, thank God I got into hockey where I put my, my OCD into uh, my work ethic. I would do things repetitiously. Um, to a fault. I mean, it overtook uh, parts of my life away from the game as well. Uh, you know, I had some contamination issues, which a lot of people can relate to. That's the first thing they uh, they think of if the OCD is hand washing. And there's so many other uh, forms or, or symptoms that uh, we can we can develop. So making it to the NHL was huge. And I guess uh, I'm best known for 1989. Uh, I was playing for the Buffalo Sabres. And I cut my jugular vein and almost uh, uh, bled out on the ice in front of, you know, everybody. And uh, my mom was watching the game on TV. And all I could think of was uh, get off the ice. I don't want her to see me die. And uh, <clears throat> I, I, I really uh, developed uh, severe symptoms after that. It was, it was the next season. I got through the season. I came back way too quick. I was back in uh, 10 days. And... Uh, <clears throat> excuse me um i had no counseling none was offered and i didn't think of it either back then that's just uh wasn't a big part of the hockey world or sports world and uh, so i just got back on the horse as quick quick as i could and it, it it may have been a good thing in some ways but uh with no counseling it probably wasn't a good thing and uh it was the next season i started to uh uh, really develop uh, obsessive uh, compulsive disorder really bad. It was hard for me to leave the house. Uh, obsessive intrusive thoughts that I couldn't get out of my head. Uh, the depression was severe. Uh, the anxiety attacks they were they, they went from just anxiety to panic attacks. Where and, and I did this all in silence. Uh, 
Uh, I didn't want to tell anybody because of the stigma, uh, which we're trying so hard to get rid of because it's perceived uh, a lot of times as, as a weakness rather than a sickness. And being an NHL goaltender, I was afraid to lose my job over, you know, being perceived as weak. So I suffered in silence and uh, I, I went about 10 days and I couldn't sleep. I started to have the flashback of that skate coming up and and uh, lacerating my neck and I would wake straight up in bed and, and it was horrible. So what I would do, I would sleep in a chair uh, where it would be like on an airplane. You don't really fall asleep. You just kind of bobble around and. So I wouldn't go into that deep sleep and have those nightmares. But uh, at 10 days of that and sleep deprivation, we uh, we had a, a Super Bowl party uh, at our captain's house in Buffalo. And, uh, uh, I, I, you know, I was certainly wasn't doing good with no sleep and these flashbacks and not telling anybody. And uh, uh, I went to the party. I only stayed there about 10, 20 minutes because I just was not myself. And so I went home and I was on some painkillers. I was playing with a broken thumb at the time. And. Um, uh, I read the label said, do not drink with alcohol. We'll make you drowsy. So I thought, wow, okay, I'm going to drink some alcohol. And I did, I drank a lot. I drank a bottle of scotch and I took some extra painkillers. Uh, next thing I know, my heart had stopped. I wake up in the hospital revived and, uh, they thought maybe it was a suicide attempt and it, it wasn't, it was sleep deprivation, uh, uh, not thinking clearly, trying to, uh, get some sleep so I could actually function in practice and games. And uh, the, the psychiatrist uh, uh, went in and asked me, well, what's going on? And I kind of told him about my panic attacks and not sleeping, uh, nightmares, uh, the OCD, not leaving the house, and, you know, really hard for me to leave the house. And uh, so I got a diagnosis of, of, these, of these disorders. But that was just the start of a uh, probably a two-and-a-half, three-year period there, different medications and different doctors and specialists and nothing was working. And you got to remember this was, you know, 30 years ago and we've come so, so much further with our therapy, counseling, medications, diagnoses. But back then uh, uh, nothing was working and my place suffered so bad. I got sent to the minors and it was kind of a blessing in one way. Yeah, I got sent to the minors, but uh, I got to see a, uh, a top psychiatrist down there that dealt with, uh, uh, mental illness and he was one of the leading guys in the U.S. and uh, his name was Dr. Stephen Stahl and he's written a lot of books and done a lot of lectures uh, since then uh, but anyways uh, he got me on the right medication after six weeks my depression had gone after nine weeks my uh, obsessiveness uh, disorder w was gone and I was like is this what it feels like to be normal for the first time in my life I really felt like wow I've been missing out, but on the other on the other side of the coin, I was just very grateful that I finally did feel good and feel productive and happy and not depressed and no panic attacks and nightmares and and uh, so consequently, I did really good on that medication for about 15 years. And uh, being a player and then a coach in the NHL, you have a team doctor and you can just get your prescription renewed. And uh, my mistake was I just kept on that same medication, didn't check in with. Uh, with my doctor and uh, with my psychiatrist and, and uh, over time my body got immune to the medication and it stopped uh, working and you know that was my fault for not you know just keeping on top of it and uh, <clears throat> ignorance too on my part I didn't know that I'd have to you know uh, keep track of my moods and and so uh, I started to self-medicate at that time I was wasn't a big drinker, but uh, I found out that booze, uh, especially beer, would help me. Uh, it calmed me down if I was anxious, uh, actually picked me up when I was depressed, and it became, a, 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 you know, a form of medication. But the problem with alcohol or drugs is, you know, what one or two or three beers would do to help you, then it became 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 18, 20, and 25 to 30 beers a day just to get through a day. And so I developed uh, alcoholism as, as well. So an another gentleman cut his jugular vein in the NHL. It's only happened twice. And uh, so I was coaching in the NHL. So I was very media accessible. And of course, they all came to me, wanted me to relive my experience. Uh, I think the fact that uh, my medication wasn't working anymore, I was spiraling down, I was self-medicating, and then reliving uh, a traumatic event that... Uh, was actually PTSD undiagnosed for at the time 20 years 
And one day I, I just, I couldn't take my brain anymore. And I, I went behind my barn and, uh, and, uh, and, and my wife showed up and I, I, you know, I, even at the time it was such a, a I was shooting, uh, targets in that back there and the gun was laying there and, and, uh, uh, she said, what's going on? I hadn't slept all night and I'd been drinking and she says, what's going on? And I said, you know what? I can't, I just want to turn this brain off. And to be honest with you, I didn't really want to die. But like a lot of people that are suicide survivors will tell you they didn't want to die, but they didn't want to live in that pain. And so I put the gun under my, my uh, chin and, and pulled the trigger. I didn't even know if it was loaded and sure enough it was. And uh, the grace of God, I, uh, the bullet lodged in my, uh, in my skull and uh yeah it was dangerous and they didn't know where the bullet was and they had to care flight me to a hospital and that's where uh, uh i i got well physically first and then i uh, went to a treatment center a dual diagnosis treatment center that deals with mental illness and and the self-medication that goes along with a lot of people that struggle with mental illness and i was in there six months and that's where I kind of really learned a lot about, well, at first I got diagnosed uh, with the PTSD and what PTSD does and, uh, and what it can do to people. And I work with a lot of military and first responders now. And we all, Garrett, we all can uh, agree on a certain amount of depression, uh, different degrees, all of us, and the same with the anxiety. And, but we have this common denominator of anger. Uh, and I think the anger comes from um, not being able to control, uh, your thoughts or, you know, my OCD had come back. So I had these ruminating thoughts and, uh, the anger of not controlling your depression and your moods. And, uh, once I learned about that and got on some new medication, uh, you know, uh, I, I got out and I wrote a book because I, I felt I had to help people, you know, I've almost died three times now. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, the, the jugular vein, th then the overdose and, uh, and then the, uh, the suicide attempt. So I felt like, uh, you know, God was speaking to me and saying, you know what, <laughs> God spared me for those that are still suffering. So I came out and I wrote a, a book on my, on my struggles in my life. And it was very, uh, open. It was very honest and very raw, and, and and that's not the way I described. It. That's the way readers have have uh, and critics have described it. And I thought, well, if I'm going to go there, I'm going to talk about how dark it was and how I how I suffered in silence because of the stigma and what it led to for me and 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 my struggles with it. And uh, and uh, that has led me to uh, you know I was coaching in the NHL at the time. And uh, that when the book came out, I, I kind of got out of the hockey and went into the uh, mental health advocacy. I didn't know the book would impact uh, people the way it did. Uh, it made me realize with uh, all the feedback that I got from fellow sufferers that uh, there's a lot of Clint Malarchuks out there. But there's also a lot of Joni Malarchuks, my wife, who had to live with me uh, and my mental illness and, and the struggles it was for her to get me help. And uh, what it led, it, you know, it, it actually led to a suicide attempt to to get me the right help, which is a shame and a disgrace. And, uh, you know, we, we've come, we're, we're working hard on the stigma, getting rid of that stigma. And uh, so now it's led to uh, my life now is, is uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a, a public speaker. I, I go around, I do book signings as well. Uh, I tell my story and it's incredible the... Uh, to, to have people come up to you after you do a talk and they, they want to embrace and they're, they're in tears. I'm in tears. And it's probably for the first time in their life, they've, they've heard somebody that say, Hey, this is a, this is a sickness and not a weakness. And you don't have to suffer in silence that there is so many people like us that can relate. And it, it, like I said, at the top, it's not always mental uh, illness, but it's uh, uh, being healthy mentally mental wellness uh so a lot of people could relate a lot of people can relate just because they've they've been depressed because they lost a loved one so they know what a depression can feel like or 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 certain things happened in their in their lives that so i just ask people to understand that um this is not a uh there's not just a few of us there's a lot of us i mean a lot of us that can relate but the problem is we just suffer uh 
in silence. So, so, you know, because of the stigma and we don't get the help and we hide it and we're great actors. We're awesome actors and, uh, we can hide it when we really need to. Uh, my, my, my bad times was when I'm alone and that's when I would start to really, uh, you know, go into my spiral down, but being, uh, that six months in treatment, uh, you know, I learned a lot. I got healthy. I got on the red, right medication. I learned tools, uh, to help me with my, with, with my down days, my tough days, my anxious days. And I, I have to be diligent on, on my mood. Uh, where am I at? Where am I at? Um, it was somebody told me one time, if you're having a bad day, you've lost your connection with your higher power. And for me, I'm a Christian, so my higher power is God and Jesus. And and uh, so I take my 10 minutes or whatever I can afford at the time and take that time out and get reconnected. And uh, it really, it's a med- form of meditation. Um, like you had mentioned uh, to me off the air, you know, uh, guys like us, we like to lay down if our anxiety is tough and, and we'll actually meditate and fall asleep. And I, I, I can go two, three days without sleeping sometimes. But if I do this, uh, it, it's not only my meditation, but it's also gets me my rest. And, uh, you know, I have some other tools that we can talk about that, uh, that, uh, I, I just love to do. And it's become a routine. It's part of my lifestyle. Uh, before my lifestyle was, uh, drinking beer and trying to feel good and just get through a day. And, uh, that's no way to live and there's no happiness in it. And it just leads to self-destruction and, and more grief down the road. Um, absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing that Clint. Um, <clears throat> a f- few things popped out to me. Um, again, like you said, um, you tried to go against God's plan, um, three times for your life. And he didn't allow it. Uh, well, first time was an accident, but you know the other two times um, when you I, tried it, to... the second time was kind of an accident too. I mean, I, it, I, I well, well, it was an accident, yeah. But sleep, it, sleep deprivation, yeah. not thinking right, um, uh, you know, not not getting help, uh, you know, just suffering in silence. And I made a mistake. Uh, that that's for sure. I, uh, I I started thinking about. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that movie. Uh, full metal jacket right but um the guys like um marines are not allowed to die without permission first yeah and uh clint you know god did not give you permission right he was like i need you here i need you to positively affect other people's lives you know they need to hear from someone um that has your platform because they again they do look at guys that are professional athletes as being like demigods right like these are the top one percent athletes and their guys are you know they're mentally strong because they train so hard well meanwhile all of our brains are wired the exact same way nobody's brain is like wired differently from from the day they birth to be able to take more to be able to withstand certain things um i'm i'm with you with growing up in a household that's not comfortable you know hearing arguments and stuff like that and seeing that and that makes guys like us angry because, you know, that's a secondary emotion because we can't really react. We're still young. We're kids, you know, when we get anxious from that. And and that's, you know, that's what, how we grow up to be where we're at today with the, dealing with the anxiety. So I, I, I'm i with you on that 100 percent. I'm glad that you are. Again, I'm going to say I'm glad you are still with us today and you're able to get the word out. Um, I want to make sure that, you know, because I run an online book club, I want to make sure that we look into your work as well. You know, read that and get a deep dive. I, I love when when people are open and honest with conversation. You know, it's not it's not again. It is a serious topic. Suicide is a serious topic. Um, depression is a serious topic. Anxiety, PTSD, uh, borderline per- personality disorder. All these all these things are serious topics. So I, I like when people are talk about them in a way that's open and honest. There's no such thing as too dark to me. You know, I, right. I, I love, I love the, the, like, this is what's happening. This is where my mind was at. This is how I felt. You know, I, I, you know, sometimes when I make a mistake now, or I'm going through something, something's not going right. And I'm worried about it. Uh, sometimes, uh, that anxiety that I had as a kid and, and that, uh, discomfort and that, and that stomach uh, churning, uh, even now when I do, when I get into that, it's almost like I'm still comfortable as uncomfortable as that is for me i almost want to stay there uh because that's how i grew up and it becomes our default mode 
And it, 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 it it's kind of hard to explain, but it, it's when you grow up in that kind of anxiety, uh, you know, violence and yelling and screaming and your parents and and uh, things going on. So I have to tell myself, whoa, 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 you don't want to stay here. This is not a good place for you, even though you grew up and there's a certain amount of uh, uh, comfort there, even though it's so uncomfortable. And uh, it's, it's, it's funny. And, you know, maybe a psychologist could explain that, uh, you know, there's probably a normal reaction for us that have been through an abusive uh, childhood. Uh, but I just have to tell myself, whoa, do the next right thing. Do the next right thing. Yeah, you made a mistake or things aren't going. Just do the next right thing. And so that's what I do. I, it's one of my ma- mantras is do the next right thing. And uh, then I go into one of my tools, like we talked about meditation. Uh, working out is another tool that I try to do daily. Um, it, it's an endorphin release. It helps uh, with depression and anxiety. Um, you know, the meditation, obviously, I, I, my biggest deal, I think, for and you could probably relate to this because you're doing this show, uh, being of service. Being of service is one of the greatest things uh, for me and helps me with my disorders more than anything because you're, you're helping. And people, people get scared when you say being of service, so I don't have time to join the Rotary Club. No, being of service is, well, for me, it's public speaking and, and for you, it's doing this show. But it can be as small as opening the door or, or smiling or trying to laugh when you don't really feel like it. And, you know, just to get out there, get out of yourself and into other people. And uh, that really is, is one of my greatest, uh, greatest tools. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm taking a course now uh, with equine therapy. Um, I have horses. I have grew up with horses. And, and for me, they're... It, it's a natural fit. So I teach people now uh, with anxiety. I, I have a, somebody visiting me right now and we've been going out there daily and working with the horse. Just uh, uh, it's a trust issue. It, it's an anxiety uh, deal because the horse is big and it can cause you anxiety. But once you, you join up and bond with this big animal and see the trust and, and, and the growth that happens with uh, not just the person, but the horse. It's incredible therapy, and they use a lot with uh, PTSD, especially the military now. Um, about a year ago, I started to have the flashbacks again, uh, the nightmares of the, the skate coming up. And I, I did, uh, I, I, I took immediate action, you know, because I didn't go to the booze. I didn't self-medicate, you know. And uh, <clears throat> I went and saw a counselor because I heard about this thing called EMDR, Eye Movement Desensitization reprocessing and it's scientific scientifically proven that this uh emdr it's kind of a left right thing of the brain and boy i I took three sessions and the nightmares disappeared the anxiety uh was gone so there's still things out there that i'm learning to uh to use and we're getting the 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 good thing yeah we're still fighting this dang uh, stigma but uh we're also progressing really uh, a lot with getting with getting help and therapies and medications and tools that work. I mean, this EMDR thing, it, it's scientifically proven and it's relatively new. So um, <clears throat> that that was uh, uh, something that I was just proactive to. So I got to I got to, you know, it, it's going to be a it, it's a lifestyle for me now to be on top of uh, Clint's feelings, emotions and where I'm at spiritually, uh, mentally, physically all these things. Absolutely. Um, you, you are hundred percent right. Um, doing service to others, man. It's like you get like a great feeling and I don't, and I don't, you don't do it just for someone to say you're welcome or praise or congratulations. Anytime someone tells me that I said, there's no need to praise me or congratulate me on anything. You know, <laughs> I'm in a position where if, I feel like if you are in a position to do something for somebody, you should do it. You know, even if I have to sometimes go out of my own comfort zone or even to go a little bit further and beyond to help people out, you should just do it. Right. And that's why I feel like my life, I've been getting blessed so recently because I, you know, if you are a good steward of what you have, you'll be blessed with more. Right. So that's, you know, that's again, that's like you said, um, also working out. I, I started a, a workout of 
check in with my podcast people. We always go to the gym every day and check in with each other, keep each other accountable, make sure we're getting some type of exercise in, man. It's really important to get to the gym because you have to, again, activate those endorphins, man. You know, there's nothing like hitting some weight or, or going to a new, you know, a new weight rank or whatever, or, you know, seeing your goals start, you know, toning up or getting bigger, whatever your goals are, just start reaching them. It, it gives you a great feeling. You and, know? And, and, and don't get frustrated. People that are new to that, um, you, you know, it's baby steps, man. I, I read about Tim McGraw, the singer. Um, <clears throat> he he was he was uh, pretty overweight and he was having some issues and that. And all he did is he started with walking 10 minutes a day. I mean, that doesn't sound like very much, but that's how he started. And now he travels with his uh, his 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 band and everything. And they have a, uh, a part of the bus or a trailer that they carry all his fitness equipment in and they're into it. And he he's really you know turned his life around but he the the point being is he started with a 10 minute walk and you know so i just encourage the listeners don't go thinking oh man i i I can't go to the gym and people are in big shape and i'm not in shape or whatever that doesn't matter you're doing it for you and you just baby step it absolutely man um and I do, I mean, I always encourage everybody, like you said, to go ahead and get to the gym. Um, another great way for me is I journal everything, man. I put my thoughts, I take them out of my head and put them on paper. Yeah. You know, I, I take them out of my head and I make sure that I make them a, a physical manifestation. So they, it's like a release that I'm feeling when I do that. Yeah. I'm releasing them and I'm not holding them in. So that's that, uh, journaling is huge. Well, and, and, and that's been proven to be helpful, too. I mean, it's not just you and me talking about these things. These things have been proven to be helpful by people and, and monitored, uh, and, and, uh, you know, kind of researched by psychiatrists and psychologists and counselors. And, and they will encourage people like us to journal and these little things, they're just little tools, but boy, they, they help us. And, uh, do you want to go like you, sometimes people go, I don't have time to journal. Or, I, I don't have the time to meditate. I don't have time to, you know, do this or that, but then do you just want to still live in that, uh, that dark, dark hell that you're in, you know, you know, you, you got to make a choice uh, uh, and take the time to either live in that hell or, or get out of it. Uh, psychologist uh, Robert Duff says, you know, you aren't supposed to use all of your coping skills all the time. You know, he gives you a, a pretty, there's a pretty decent list of things you can do, man. Uh, breathing exercises, you know, reading is, I love reading, man. Oh man. Reading is, you just I, again, I, I'm fasting right now. So instead of eating at times when I'm supposed to eat, I, I feed my mind instead. So I pick up a book instead and, and replace the food with that. You know, well, you know, I, I like to read, too, because uh, I like to read uh, things uh, associated with the psychology and and things that I can relate to or try to relate to and learn uh, and better myself. And I read a book uh, some years ago called The Untethered Soul. And uh that it, every book is different and you can read a book and it, it doesn't speak to you, but then you go back and reread it sometime later in your life. and You go, Whoa, I missed something here. This is a great book. And so that book uh, really spoke to me uh, where I was at my, at my uh, stage of recovery. And uh, so it's a book that I highly recommend to people. Um, you know, some chapters uh, I didn't really relate to, but some I went, Whoa, this is good stuff. And it, it's it's the book to kind of in, introduce me to uh, slowing down and, and to meditate. And, uh, uh, you know, and some people get scared with that word meditation. They think you got to sit there cross-legged and go ohm. <laughs> well, that's, it, that's fine. That's good. That's a good one. But, you know, my wife, I encouraged her to to meditate and she's she's one of those oh i don't die i don't I, I can't turn my mind off or you know she's just like no interest in even trying it and i have a little emotional support dog and one day she she's uh i was doing what a, a different form of my meditation is sometimes i got a piece of grass in front of my barn that is uh it doesn't have a sprinkler system so i have to water it by hand and just standing there watching the water kind of the droplets come out and hit the grass and thinking about the grass getting its, you know, its water that it needs. And, and she, she comes back on this bike ride. She puts his dog in the basket in the front of the bicycle and she comes back and, and I said, so how was your meditation, honey? And she goes, what are you talking about? I said, you're doing that every day. You just love to go out on that bike ride with that dog in the basket and chill and enjoy nature. Cause we live kind of uh, 
in a rural area. So, you know, there's a, there's the mountains, there's the, you know, the sagebrush the, and that, and that's what she does. And she, but she didn't realize that that is actually a form of meditation. So I just, again, my point being is encouraging listeners, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a real structured uh, deal. And, and again, you can baby step pretty soon. Maybe you get into a different uh, form of meditation. I've got several that I use. And it's not always like uh, you and I said, we lay on the bed and try and get uh, reconnected with our higher power or, or, or prayer. And uh, I used to pray a lot and, and say words, um, you know, like the Lord's Prayer or whatever. Before you know it, my mind, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm saying the words, but my mind isn't even on the words. So uh, what I do now is I just, uh, my meditation is I reconnect. And it's not words, it's, it's thinking about my higher power and, and him uh, filling me, helping me, nourishing me, in, in, you know, and nourishing my spirituality, whatever it might be. And before you know it, I'm I'm pretty dang calm. And uh, you know, a lot of times I get, like all of us, we get overwhelmed with jobs, kids, sports going on, this that as parents, and and uh, we we just get overwhelmed, and we don't take that ten minutes or twenty minutes or whatever you can afford to to just reconnect and. You, you realize I can't do this on my uh, on my own. So I I have to turn a lot of stuff over to my a lot of stuff I'm worrying about after I meditate. I went, what the heck was I worried about? The big guy's handling that for me now. Anyways, you know, it's like he, he, he took it off yeah. my plate, you know, well, it, you know, but it, it, even if it, if it's him just putting it in perspective, is that really important? Is that really worth worrying about? And, you know, you're kind of speaking to me, you know what, I'll take care of that. You just you just feel good. <laughs> It's so funny you said that. Uh, my mom uh, had called me yesterday. She was kind of worried. And this is where I'm at now, man. Like you said, I've been meditating and I've been like, I'm slowly but surely getting stronger in, in other aspects outside of physically and coming to the understanding that um, you know, my mom called me concerned about something yesterday. And I just let her know, like, you know, if whatever happens, what's meant to happen, if something bad happens, it's setting you up for something good to happen later on down the road. And it kind of calmed her down a little bit just to hear me say that to her. But that's where I'm at right now. I mean, well, do you, you, know, do, you do you believe uh, do you believe in the phrase that some people say it and some people don't quite uh, agree with it? But, you know, everything happens for a reason. What, what's yeah. Your, oh, yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. A, a lot of things happen. Uh, a lot of things happen for a reason. And I was telling her, uh, uh, you know, yes, yesterday I was working a job last year. I didn't really like um, it was paying me pretty well. And um, anybody who knows me that knows me personally knows I'm a hard worker. You know, I don't I don't for the lack of a better way of saying it, I don't fuck around when it comes to work. And I make sure that I'm associated with something that's like this guy put in all the effort he can. Right. So I, I bust my ass this job for about six, seven, eight months last year. And uh, for some reason, they started. I guess they were trying to do like budget cuts or something like that, but they let me go. They let me go, and I've never been like fired from a job before. Yeah. So um, it did mess with me at the time because you know psychologically, it's something that you never. I've never been fired from a job before. So then I, I look back at it now, you know, where it set me up to do what I'm doing now. You know, I have a better job now, which I'm more comfortable doing. And I told my mom, I, I even sent my boss. You know, I, he didn't reply obviously because most people don't expect this from somebody. But I, I sent them a text message saying um, I want to thank you for letting me go last year, you know, because it, it's it, I was in a bad place mentally and now I'm much better right now today. And he yeah. didn't respond to me. Let, let me ask you this, though. Did you have some when you got fired? I, pro, I bet you had some uh, resentment because you, as you said, you gave your heart and soul and worked your butt off and then you get let go. So uh, you probably had some resentment and resentment uh for for us i i think i can when i say us i'm talking about us struggle with uh you know anxiety or depression mental illness or whatever you want to call it um resentment can really set us in a in a in a, in a spiral the wrong way and so we gotta we gotta manage the, that resentment and i think what, what you just explained at the time you probably you know were kind of resentful and hurt and you know like like we discussed you know uh, everything happens for a reason. So that door closed, but look at the door that opened and what you're doing now. Absolutely. If, if that door didn't close, I wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation with you right now because I'll be out working and, you know, I work from home now. Right. So I would, I wouldn't be able to, you know, fire up the podcast machine. I'll be out somewhere in a truck, but yeah, I did. And for about a few weeks, I did have resentment. Um, 
you know, again, like you said, I put my heart and soul into it. But around that time, it was vacations coming up, uh, you know, my mom's wedding. There was so much I had going on right now that helped take my mind off of it a little bit and put me at ease and, you know, change change my perspective a lot. So it was uh, again, man, like you said, it was it was it was kind of I did have some resentment at first. But then I, you know, everything happens for a reason, like we said. Uh, it was it was setting me up for being in a better position, so I could be in a better place mentally. Yeah, and and it, it, a lot of times we we don't understand uh, why you know there's why bad things happen to good people. Here you were being the the good guy, you know, working your butt off and everything. Why did something bad you got let go happen? And uh, you know, like it happened for a reason. Yeah, it was, and, and you know, so the, the funniest thing about it though is like a week before I got let go, I was on the phone with my mom telling her, I was like, man, I was like, mom, I can't, re- I don't think I'm gonna be able to do this job anymore. You know, it, it was at the point where it was just because, like, yeah, I told you the money was good, but it wasn't for me, the work wasn't for me. So, you know, when I told her that, you know, I started looking for other jobs and stuff like that, and not even a week later, um, I was let go. So, I also look back at that and look at it as, as, as I was being pushed in the direction I was supposed to go in because yeah. I, I was comfortable with the money, you know, I wasn't gonna leave because of the money. And it was like it just dried up on me. It was like, oh, you're gone. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So well, that that's pretty strange to think about. Yeah, it happened for a reason. So I uh, we talked a little bit about uh, you know ways to cope with anxiety, but I want to I want to talk a little bit about um, about PTSD. So um, I saw a politician yesterday. He posted something talking about. Um, this this one this this woman saying that she thinks she has PTSD because she said she was talking about how being around the war zone and like you know losing loved ones and stuff made her develop it. He was like, well, you were never like in the military and you never did this, you never did that. And a very common misconception is that PTSD only happens to those that are in the military, oh. and that's and that's hor- That's so far from the truth. That's we, so far from the truth. You, you, you know what we? I think we all have trauma. Well, we do. We all have trauma in in our lives i mean divorce can be traumatic uh losing a loved one could be traumatic uh you know having a boss that you have to go get he yells at you or she yells at you every day you know that can be uh you know traumatic over time you know it it doesn't have to be a major car accident or military uh we all we all have trauma that happens in our life now does it does it form into full-blown post-traumatic stress disorder not always but we do have trauma and the thing that we got to learn as people we hold all these things in we're tough and like you said about athletes they, you know they wear the superman cape and they're, they're invincible and you know that so they never let their guard down and and uh so we don't learn to process uh trauma and I, when i was in the 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 treatment center they were trying to tell me i had ptsd and i'm like no i don't no i don't why do i why do you think that we said well you cut your neck and you you know you came back right 10 days later you're playing and, and you never processed anything and then the next year things really started to spiral for you down and and uh it, you know and I, I i just never so i learned i had 20 years of all that so she did a therapy on me well first of all i read a book on on uh trauma and how animals process trauma and one of the stories is that you know a gazelle is in is in flight we've all heard of fight fight and flight and there's also something called freeze so the 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 tiger catches the gazelle and drags him to the ditch and he he, now he's going to go get the cubs and come and eat the gazelle but the gazelle wasn't dead it went into what they call freeze and so the tiger thought that it was dead and so the important part is how's the, how did the gazelle process trauma? Well, it got up and it shook one limb, shook another limb, shook all four limbs, and then shook its whole body violently. And then boing, 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 he was gone. And I thought, wow, so that's how animals kind of process it. They shake it. And, they, and so my wife was coming to visit me in the treatment center. She got a little fender bender. And uh, she told me, oh, the police came and I filled out a report. I held it. She was so proud. She, oh, I held it together. I held it together. And, and then she goes all disappointed. She goes, and then I got in the car and I just started to shake. And then I cried. And I was like, that's it. I was jumping around. And she goes, whoa, you're on medication here. You, I said, you don't understand. It's the gazelle, you know. And so I bought into the PTSD that I had it. And number one, that I hadn't processed it. It was still in my body. It was trapped there. 
and uh that that's where the untethered soul taught taught me about some of the stuff where we just trap stuff inside and it, it grows and grows and then one day it could explode into a an illness maybe a physical illness maybe a mental illness and uh my first session with this gal uh i cried and i started crying and then i'm but the thing is i cried for three days and it wasn't like sobbing or any tears just kept running down my face and i wasn't sad or thinking sad thoughts i just had tears coming anyways uh they explained to me that was uh, 20 years of trauma uh releasing from my body and uh my, my the, first of all i had the acceptance okay i got ptsd then i got you know into action and got the therapy and and let it happen let it pour out of me and uh you know 20 years of trauma it took three days of tears uh you know just pouring out of me and i mean it was a constant tears <laughs> and and so you know people don't understand that we we need to process like if you lose a loved one yes you gotta grieve and you can get angry you know you you know you don't understand why why did this person you know there's things that uh we got to just let go through our body and our mind and our soul and and you know just let things happen and 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 process it like animals do and we are animals but as humans and society and with the stigma we push through life we hide it don't cry don't you dare cry in public you know remember you, you, you when you're a little boy if you're crying my dad would go well, i'll give you something to cry about and raise his hand so the message there is you don't cry you know f physical pain okay maybe you cry i don't know uh and people relate and we all relate to a broken arm or something oh man that hurts but it's hard to see mental illness or or people struggling uh because we hide it and the reason we hide it is because of the the stigma it, that it's a weakness and and not a sickness and and we we need to process these things or or they they end up biting us in the butt later on i just i just want to say that you must, you must have felt so relieved. I mean, because soon as you said tears started flowing and it kept flowing, I was like, that's a release to trauma. And then you said it, it while you were tell, explaining it. I was like, man, you must have felt so relieved after that, after they finally stopped coming out. Uh, like, oh, it must have yeah. felt, yeah. felt like a burden, right? Well, I felt like I was on top of the world that something like, like something was lifted off my shoulders. But I, I would rather say something was lifted out of my gut, you know, a big stone, a big boulder that I've been carrying around in there that, you know, was the, the, uh, the untreated, undiagnosed, unprocessed PTSD it was this big, big boulder in my, in my belly. And I was, I was having this conversation with someone under there. I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. Um, growing up being, a, you know, they, they, they label, um, cause I'm a black man. They label us as being angry black man, but as, as kids and you experience it too, you just said it yourself. We're taught, as as your little boys, not to express sadness. We're not supposed to express our sadness. We're supposed to just hold it in, or we'll get something to cry about. Don't cry, or I'll give you something to cry about. Right. So, the secondary emotion, what they say is is anger. So when when you you know you're not expressing the first emotion, the secondary emotion comes out. So we grow up just not knowing how to express ourselves because we never got an opportunity to. We always were told to hold it in, so we hold it in when we get older. You know, it's subconsciously embedded in our mind for us to hold it in. And it just comes out, you know, the anger comes out. That's what comes out instead, instead of the sorrows, instead of expressing yourself, instead of sadness. And that's trauma, man. That you, you, you're traumatizing your kids by teaching them not to express themselves. Well, and not just that, it's society. Society is, you know, we still have that. Well, you don't cry, don't cry in public, you know. Um, you, you know, it, it, it's like uh, you hold it in and you tough it up. Hey, you know, cowboy up, man up, whatever the term they might use. Uh, yeah, you don't, you don't, you don't show that. You don't, you, you, you don't express that. That's, that's, that's something you just keep inside. You be tough. You be tough. You be tough. You know, which is wrong. Man, uh, when you kind of, you kind of gave me a little bit of a flashback when you said, uh, I'll give you something to cry about. It kind of put me back in that <laughs> when I was a kid, like, oh yeah, that sounds familiar, you yeah. know, but you know, that's again, that's, that's a lot of cycle that we have to break. You know, when I do start having children, I'm going to make sure that they are comfortable and they should be comfortable expressing themselves to your, your, your parent. Right. They shouldn't be afraid to cry around you or be sad around you. You know, let them let, let them cry it out and let them be whatever they're sad about and let them know uh, things could be things will get better. Right? right. I mean, kids, kids worlds are a lot different than us. Things that we look at as being minuscule are huge deals to them, huge deals to them. Right. They don't understand the concept of reality yet. They're still just kids, you know. 
So when when they come to you with the with these, you know, sorrows and sadness, oh, I was being bullied at school, or I had this going. Don't don't push that away. You know, well, you better bully them back. No, let them express themselves to you, because again, you can't. You don't want the kids to start feeling like that. There's not there's nothing else for them. You know, I've I've been reading articles. I saw, I read an article that said a ten year old kid committed suicide. Right. A ten year old kid committed suicide that's to me that's inexcusable yeah on, on, yeah on on so many levels there's so much negligence there that's involved with that and that, that just that pisses me off man when i read articles like that man because that should not happen no especially at 10 years old can you believe it and part of that's the internet uh people can hide behind their phone or computer and they can bully and and uh, they don't understand i i gave a talk one time and and here, here's another here's uh, everybody uh, feels sorry for the the person being bullied but I, I, always, I feel sorry for the bully. What is going on in that person to be a bully? There's something, uh, there's something there that that person has to pick on others to feel, to feel good about themselves. And that's not, that's not healthy. So it, it's, a, it's a, 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 yeah, you feel sorry for the person being bullied. But what about the bully? No one ever kind of thinks, oh, man, what's going on in this kid's uh, head to be a bully, to be a mean person or to, you know, maybe it's uh uh, low self-esteem so they that's how they get their self-esteem has been a uh, bully and you know so we got to think of it both ways uh, you know that people are you know sick being bullied and get you know and I always get I when I give a talk I, to high schools and that I said you know the, about the bullying I said you know what we have suicides you know off the charts now with our with our teens and our youth and and a lot of it is caused by bullying and I say to them if you are a bully you know, why? Think about it. Why are you a bully? Is it to make yourself feel good? But what if somebody kills himself because you bullied them and it got on the Internet and it was constant and they just couldn't, they, they, their self-worth was nothing and they died by suicide? How would you like that to live the rest of your life with that? And I think it hits a lot of the bully kids in high school. You know, they think about it and go, you know, wow, you know, I don't want that on my plate. And uh, I spoke at a high school one time. And this girl comes up to me after and she's in tears and she rolls up her sleeve and she had cuts all over her arms. You know, that she was a cutter, as they call them. And, uh, you know, it's a self mutilation. It can be a first step to uh, suicidal thinking and, and things like that, you know, self mutilation. And uh, uh, we were both crying. And, and I said to her, um, <laughs> shit, I get emotional just uh um telling the story um so i said would you talk to your school counselor she said yes but my point being for the she had she had shown nobody her scars nobody she was old enough to dress her own way and she always wore long sleeves so her parents never even saw the scars and for the first time in her life she heard somebody uh speak about uh uh depression and she had severe depression and anxiety and uh, so I said, would you talk to your school counselor? And she did. And uh, I kept in touch with that girl for, I don't know, three, four years after that. And she was doing fantastic. So, you know, it, we don't know. And I'm talking to all of the listeners. We don't know how we can impact uh, people. It, you know, it could be the smallest, smallest thing in the world, uh, you know, being a friend to somebody or, or saying nice things to somebody um smiling to somebody you know it you know helping somebody out a little bit and you know we don't know how how far uh i had a gal we were doing a fundraiser and she was a volunteer middle uh, older lady but one day she came into the our little office and 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 i and she she was dressed real nice i said man you look good you look really sharp and she well thank you and about a month later she came up to me and said uh clint i want to thank you and I said, uh, for what? She goes, that compliment. I mean, this is three weeks later, a month. And I go, well, what, what are you talking about? What compliment? She goes, remember I came in, you said I looked real sharp and nice. I said, yeah. And she goes, well, she went on to tell her story, what was going on at home with her husband and a lot of abuse and everything. So that compliment that I gave her didn't make her day. It made her month and got her through it. Uh, maybe she felt some good energy or some love from me or something, you know, uh, because she wasn't getting it at home. She was getting the opposite at home and feeling really, really terrible about herself. 
uh, basically being bullied probably by her husband. So we don't know the impact that we can have on on people. And it does it, it can be the smallest things. Uh, you, you know, I always use that word baby step it and and uh, to help people. Absolutely. Absolutely. That that you really hit it right there on the head, man. When it's all about just sometimes just the smallest gestures can mean so much to somebody. Yeah. You know, just the smallest gestures. I had somebody tell me that um, they were they were minutes away from taking their own life. They were minutes away from taking their own life. They were about to go overdose on pills. And I always I believe, again, everything happens for a reason. You know, um, the, the God put them on my mind and I reached out to them to check on them. And it just like, you know, that that reaching out to them, check them. Like, hey, how you doing? What's going on with you? That just had such a positive impact on them that it just like changed the whole landscape for the, for their life. Yeah. Well, I had, uh, it, you, you never know. I had a guy that contacted, well, he came to hear me speak, but he told me his story. He went, he was, he, he went out to a, he drove out into this big grassy field and he had a gun and he took, he took, he took one bullet because that's all it would need, he said. And, uh, but he dropped the bullet loading the, loading the gun, trying to load the gun and he couldn't find it in this deep grass. And, uh, then he heard me speak and, and it just it hit him like, whoa, I'm not alone. Other people do struggle. Other people do have si- suicidal thoughts and depression, and and we don't. The, the point is, we don't. We don't. We got to understand that we can. We can touch people in ways that we don't even know we're we're helping them half the time. You know, another example would be like, let's say you're in the weight room and you see this skinny guy, uh, you know, trying to you know get bigger, and and you walk by and say, hey, nice lift there. I was glad. You don't know what that that probably made his day. You know what I mean? It, it's it's just these little things that they're there for us but we we're 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 afraid to give compliments and it's uncomfortable for a lot of us to to take compliments right it's just kind of like the way i don't know if it's society or human nature but we a lot of people feel uh you know uh uncomfortable giving a compliment and uh, maybe they think it's going to be taken the wrong way or something but you know i'm big on give compliments and it, it's just little things like i they, that's just an example that you know some guy trying to work out and he's brand new to it and maybe you're maybe i don't know what you look like you probably sound, if you work out you're probably in pretty damn good shape so a guy like you walking by saying something nice to that kid saying hey nice lift good job uh you know probably made that guy <laughs> keep working out he didn't quit you know maybe he was ready to quit because he wasn't getting the results quick enough you never know and these are, these are just examples that we're talking about that hopefully our listeners uh, uh, take to heart and and learn, uh, you know, learn from what we're, we're saying. Because you and I have been through the, the darkness and, and suffering and silence. And and there's so many of us out there that are in that. And, you know, for me, giving the compliment makes me feel good, too. Giving, me, giving a speech and people go, oh, man, that must be so hard. And, man, it makes me feel great. I, I'm selfish, man. I'm doing it for me, too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, compliments do go a long way. Uh, to ask your question, I, I'm all right, man. You know, I, I'm, I'm OK. I'm not like Dwayne Johnson or anybody out here. I'm, I'm just all right. Um, but, um, yeah, it's just people just got to just it's, it's so simple, man. It sound, it's so simple. But again, it's like you don't re- people don't realize what it does for others. So look, I mean, I, look, I, I, look for those look for those little opportunities to throw out a, a a smile or a compliment. You know, they're they're there every day, every day, all day long. I want to thank you again, Clint, for uh, sitting down and having this conversation with me, man. I'm sure that we can go much longer, but uh, I just want to see if you have any last words of advice you want to share with everybody before we get out of here today. Well, my biggest thing is you're not alone. If you're, if you think you're like, I used to think I'm, no one relates to me. I'm I, no, I'm my depression, my anxiety, my, my nightmares, all you know, I'm the only one. And then, then I kind of thought about it. I said, well, there's other people out there that suffer because I've done some research, but then I go, yeah, but they're not as bad as me. They're not as sick as me. And so my biggest message is people is you you are not alone. You are not alone. Everybody struggles. Maybe not every day, maybe not all the time. Some deeper than others. Some are mentally ill like me and really have to work, uh, work at it. Um, but, but yeah, you're not alone. Just do not suffer in silence. Uh, get help. Talk to a friend. Talk to a parent. 
talk to a coworker, talk to somebody that you trust. And for those people that have a hard time hearing those things, you know what? The two biggest words in the world in the world, and we can all relate to it because we've all suffered at some at some level as part of life. Two big words, me too. That's all you have to say. You know, somebody maybe comes and tells it what they're going through and you can go, yeah, me too. Not today, but I remember when I was going through that divorce, man, I was so depressed. I was, I, I wanted to end my life or, or whatever, you know, don't be shy to open up and, and say me too, because we're all in it together and everybody can relate to at least a degree of suffering. Absolutely, I hundred percent agree. Your your statement, I mean, your mission is literally again. Let's let's talk it out. You know, we we you're not alone out there. Um, there are people out there that do relate to you. So I mean, oh. I've been trying to build a community up, man. I'm trying to get as many people as possible, reach as many lives as possible, just so they can understand that, man. Understand your mission and understand what you're saying, because that's again, a hundred percent what I'm I'm about and hundred percent what I'm behind. So. Um, I for, get, I mean, for listeners too, I, I I have a website with a whole bunch of interviews and and all sorts of things that I I try to help people with. It's uh, malarchuk.com, M-A-L-A-R-C-H-U-K, and there's just interviews. I'm open, I'm raw, I'm I'm real, and uh, it's me too, me too. I'll make sure I have that inside the description of the episode for people at the bottom. So. Uh, again, Clint, thank you for coming on. Um, this doesn't have to be your last time on. If you ever want to have a conversation with me again, I'm always open for that. Um, Anytime. You know, I really enjoyed our talk. I, man, I really did, too. I'm sure listeners will as well when they listen back. Um, if you're listening back to this, if you're listening for the first time, I appreciate you for a bit for your interest. If you are returning, I appreciate your dedication to the podcast. Um, I look forward to talking to you guys again in the future.